tonight we are going to be discussing voting uh, during COVID-19 in the state of Connecticut with Denise Merrill, our Secretary of State. This evening's co-sponsored with the League of Women Voters of New Canaan and also Darien and the New Canaan Library. And I just want to mention the programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So we thank all of you for your continued support to make those programs like this available to the community. Thank you. Over to Mickey Porta. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Darien Library. I'm Mickey Porta, president of the League of Women Voters of New Canaan. And Darien League President Clara Sartori and I are pleased that you're joining us to hear about your voting options this November. Namely, voting in person as per usual and also learning how to apply for and properly fill out an absentee ballot. So walking us through the process tonight is the ultimate source, Connecticut's Chief Elections Official, Secretary of State Denise Merrill. Secretary Merrill will talk first, and then Clara and I will read your questions aloud afterward doing, during our Q&A. Secretary Merrill, thank you for being here tonight and for all that you're doing to protect voting in our state. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you guys for doing this. It's terribly important that we get the right public information out about voting this year. There's so much going on at the national and at the state level and with COVID and kids going back to school and a coming election that is one of the most contentious I can remember. Uh, it's really, really important that we all know what's going on. I just thought I'd start by showing you this wonderful necklace. I don't know um, if you can see it, but anyway, uh, it is actually a head of Susan B. Anthony. A dear friend of mine gave this to me and said, you are the new guardian of, of the vote for women. Uh, we have to remember that actually this, this Monday, uh, we are going to have a ceremonial signing that this was the date that Connecticut actually ratified uh, the 19th Amendment. And I think this year, more than ever, I am so aware of the job we all have in maintaining our elections. I, it's, uh, it's never been more under scrutiny. I feel like every day something new comes up. Uh, we haven't even talked about cybersecurity, the kinds of attacks that are going on from foreign and domestic interference in our elections. I've never uh, seen anything like it. I've been in politics for 30 years now. And uh, I am so conscious of what we need to do here. So again, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm gonna take you through this only because Connecticut, we have to understand, is the most restrictive state in the country right now um, for absentee ballot voting. Uh, in fact, for voting generally. And it's not a great place to be. Um, it, it has come upon us over a number of years. I've made suggestions and uh, uh, all kinds of legislative proposals over the last 10 years. And we are still, we have no early days of early voting. 40 other states have days of early voting. Uh, and we have no uh, easy access to absentee ballots. Well, of course, COVID changed everything and we were left trying to recreate a system where no one would have to choose between their health and their vote. That's the bottom line. That's why we're doing all of this. And it isn't easy to change a system and turn it on its head within just a few months, but we're going to do it. And I think we're gonna do a pretty good job of it, honestly. Uh, normally in most elections, about four to 8% of people vote by absentee ballot. And maybe some of you have done that, uh, it's usually because you're going to be out of town on election day, which is one of the standard excuses you need to get an absentee ballot in Connecticut. It's in our state constitution, which means it isn't easy to change. Uh, in the primary, we saw 68% of people chose to vote by absentee ballot. Uh, and that's because we made it easier and hopefully we made them understand that they didn't have to risk their health by going to the polling places. On the other hand, we also had to assure people and still continue to assure people that the polling places will be safe, as safe as we can make them. 
we are going to follow all the CDC guidelines. We are going to have people standing six feet apart. We're going to scrub down the, the uh, polling places. We're going to have PPE. We're going to require masks as much as we can. Uh, so, so this is the dual process we have to go through. Uh, but since absentee balloting is really the question of the hour, uh, because some of us are just, we're just not familiar with this. So I thought I'd start by just, I have a quick little PowerPoint, which hopefully uh, any of you can use with your own groups or uh, towns or whatever, just to sort of get people familiar with the very basic things they have to do to vote absentee ballot. So this is where we're gonna stay. And by the way, it is only for this election. Uh, the legislation that the uh, General Assembly passed was clearly just the election in 2020. If we want to continue this kind of process, we'll have to start over again next year. But for now, this is where we are. Okay, so thank you, Mickey, you can change. First of all, who voted in the primary? Um, as I just said, about 68% of people did choose to use absentee ballots. Uh, there was a fairly high turnout. I mean, it's not extraordinary or anything, but it was certainly higher than usual. And we are anticipating again, that it will be uh, higher again. So um, altogether, both parties had uh, primaries. Uh, we had 348,205 people who actually voted and 58%, according to this uh, group, voted absentee. Uh, but then later on, we had an even higher count uh, Democrats did vote in higher numbers by absentee than Republicans. I don't know if that'll hold true. The number we are using to kind of calculate how to plan for the election is we're figuring there's going to be between an 80 and 90% turnout of registered voters. Um, and remember, that's not everybody. Uh, that's another tale for another day. Um, so so based on what we saw in the primary, uh, we're gonna plan accordingly. So we'll plan for about an 80 to 90% turnout of all voters, and we have 2.1 million registered voters in the state of Connecticut. So let's talk about who's eligible to vote absentee ballot in this November election. Any voter can check the box, which is newly developed on the application uh, that says, that you are uh, concerned about the COVID pandemic. I forget how we exactly word it, but I'll show you in a minute. And then of course, the, all, all the other reasons still apply. If you're out of town, if you're permanently disabled, if you're unable to get to the polls uh, for any of the other four reasons we normally allow, you can certainly still do that. Okay, next slide. Applications for absentee ballots will be mailed to all active registered voters. Don't forget, this is just the application. This is an example of some of the disinformation that was going around earlier this year. We do not mail ballots directly to voters. Sometimes I wish we would, but we'd have to have a lot more process in place to make that the case. Uh, we have just started mailing the applications out and hopefully some of you have already gotten them. Uh, they started being, uh, they, we started mailing them uh, last Friday, so they'll be mailed all this week uh, on a rolling basis by the size of town. We decided to uh, mail the ones to the larger towns first, knowing that they had a much bigger job on their hands processing. Um, we are recommending that every voter go check your registration status at our website, myvote.ct.gov backslash lookup. You can look up your name, your address, your party affiliation, and make sure it's correct. We have many disappointed people on election day who forgot that they moved, that they didn't change, they think that the registration follows them, it does not. Even if you move across town, you could have a problem. So we recommend everyone look on that. And I'm gonna tell you more about that later because we now do have a ballot tracking system, which is new. So you will be able to go to this same website and, and look and see if your ballot has actually been logged in by the town clerks. Okay, next slide. So this is what you do to return your absentee ballot application. Let's say you decide, I want to vote absentee ballot this year. I'm feeling uh, that it's too much of a risk for me to go to the polling places. Uh, maybe you're over 65, like I am, uh, or in a, some other risk category. But anyone can do this. So you're going to return the application. How do you do it? First of all, you do it right away. 
Um, we know about the questions that have arisen about the Postal Service. I am not convinced that it's going to be manageable um, after what I've seen it right here in Connecticut. We have assurances from them and we have marked the uh, applications and the ballots with special envelopes that show that it's election mail. We've done all those things. Uh, still, just get it in the mail as soon as you get it, if you're gonna use it. Uh, or even better, you can drop it off in the pictured, secure, safe absentee ballot drop box stationed outside your town hall. Every town has at least one. Uh, and we have bought some extras because they were so popular in the primary. People really like the idea that they know their ballot absolutely has arrived. They're extremely secure. They have tiny little openings to put your ballot in. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about these. They're used very frequently in many other states. We're very happy with them. They're extremely secure and solid and bolted to the ground and usually have security cameras involved. So you can feel good about dropping your ballot in the box. And frankly, I would recommend it. Okay, next one. Um, Here's a picture of the actual application, which of course you can get right on our website. Uh, anyone can download an application, but the reason we're mailing them along with a stamped self-address envelope is because you still have to print it out, which I have to say I'm not happy about. We still have not got a lot of technology. Uh, we're behind the times. Hopefully we can fix that soon. Uh, if the legislature will vote in some new processes for us. So um, as you can see, uh, the application is pretty straightforward. We always tell people, just remember, you've got to sign it. That's the big thing. Um, if you don't sign it, it won't happen. And that's the end of that. You can see there is the COVID excuse there in section two, uh, right at the top. And then the others are listed below that. Um, we ask for your telephone and email address for a reason. If you put them in, then if something goes wrong with your ballot, let's say your ballot comes back and you did forget to sign the inner envelope or something like that, the town clerks, in, particularly in smaller towns, will be able to contact you and let you know that unless you fix the ballot, it will not be counted. You know, we have a pretty low rate of spoiled ballots here in Connecticut, but uh, it does happen. And so uh, we really recommend you give us that information, even though I know people are worried about giving their personal information, I would do it here. Um, so you can see it's the, other than that, it's a pretty standard uh, form. And you see there, you can get it on our website. You can also get it at your town hall, uh, which you always could do. But we did all this because the town halls weren't even open when we started this process. And even now they're, I think, under very limited hours and staffing. So um, I think this has been a tremendous asset to the voters to mail out these applications. Okay, next. All about ballots. Okay, ballots this year will be mailed by the town clerks. So when you send your application back, it's gonna go back to your town clerk. The big thing to remember is that ballots are not available to be sent back to you until October 2nd. We had a lot of confusion in the primary because people got the application, they were all excited, they sent it right back, and then they had to wait three or four weeks to get the ballot. And we had thousands of people calling our office saying, where's my ballot, where's my ballot? So we really need, need to make people understand, you're not gonna get it before almost mid-October. That is the law and it's there for a reason. It takes us time to print the over 500 different ballot styles that we have in Connecticut. Again, we have a lot of checks and balances, but it's a very cumbersome system for a, a mail-in ballot. And so we just have to deal within the laws we currently have. Um, so return the applications and ballots as soon as possible. Use the Dropbox uh, is, I think, preferable. Ballots must be received by eight o'clock on election day. Uh, we had a call with the registrars today and there were a lot of questions about what happens if somebody walks in with their absentee ballot and wants to just uh, file it right there on election day. That you can put it in the ballot box. So that's our suggestion. If you're someone who wants to come down on election day, just stick it in the ballot box and it'll still get counted if it's before eight o'clock. Uh, again, voters can check to see when the town issues their ballot on our voter lookup tool. This is a new function. I think it's going to do a long way 
to assure people that their ballot is being received and counted. And there's the site again, myvote.ct.gov. Okay, next. I love this slide because it's so simple. <laughs> And it sounds silly, but we do have problems when people forget to do one of these things. Mark your ballot, fold it, insert it into the inner envelope, which is the one that has all the writing on it. Sign it, date it, seal it, one ballot per envelope. And then you insert the sealed inner ballot into the outer envelope. Every one of those steps is important, as simple as it sounds. So that's about it. Uh, next slide shows you the outer envelope. It has been redesigned and you see the special yellow color there. That's what shows the Postal Service that it's election mail uh, and that will hopefully flag it and make it go faster, we hope. Uh, you can see the postage is prepaid. Our office is sending money to the towns to pay for all postage uh, related to the election. Thank you to our congressional delegation for getting um, a, a large slice of CARES Act funding, $5 million to the state to help pay for all the things I'm describing here. Okay, next. Return your ballot. Drop it in the regular mail if you have time. In person at the town clerk's office, uh, and we're saying you never know what those office hours are, check to be sure. The secure ballot drop box again has been provided to each town and it's probably located out outside of town hall. And again, voters can check to see if their ballot has been received by the town on our voter lookup tool. Okay, then, now we come to the part that suddenly the entire world is interested in. You know, it's fascinating to me that we've gone probably 50 or 100 years now without anybody thinking too much about how their ballot gets processed, unless you're actually in the biz, as they say. So if you're a candidate or you're working with political parties, you may be more aware than the public. All of a sudden, everyone wants to know. There have been so many questions raised about, is there fraud? Can people vote twice? You know, is my vote secure? Is it, is it secure from Russian interference? So here I just sort of describe what happens when the ballot gets received. They check the serial number on a barcode match uh, on the inner envelope. Uh, that's why we're allowing clerks to open the outer envelope in advance because that's fine. And then they can match up the voter with the ballot. Uh, the, cure, the, the clerk then secures the ballot, still sealed, until election day. And then the clerk pre-marks the election day checklist to indicate if the voter returned an absentee ballot before election day. That's how we know that someone can't vote twice. And I get asked this multiple times a day uh, because of all the concern. If you've been involved in this and have been a poll worker, or been at the polls, and I know many league people are involved in election day, you know that this list is compared against the people who vote in person. And if there's an absentee ballot that comes in, we simply discard the absentee ballot because the person has voted. And it's a very, very good way of cross-checking the system. Okay, next. On election day, any AB received on election day will be checked against the voter list, as I just said. And each town, uh, this is a little different. Each town has up to 48 hours to report the total votes. Uh, this gives me uh, concern. I have to say, I, I know that one of the, my biggest concern uh, today is that election day will be delayed, uh, that the results will be delayed. Connecticut certainly isn't the biggest uh, problem in this area. We're not a swing state. Sometimes I think I'm glad. Um, and so we have given uh, the registrars and clerks another 48 hours in which to make sure all the absentee ballots are counted because we're going to have such an extraordinary number of those and they cannot be counted entirely until after eight o'clock and there's a, a tabulator involved. So, so that's going to require some patience from the public um, and you know who knows what's going to happen with you know people are so on edge and tensions are running so high that I do worry about this, but I know that the officials will be give every effort to make sure they do get the results in by midnight, which is usually what they're required to do. But we felt it's only fair to make it realistic and say that they have up to two days to get those results in. Um, 
So those are just the preliminary results, of course. We don't really certify an election for two weeks, and sometimes there are changes. Uh, but the total results uh, don't have to be in for another 96 hours. So again, there will be a delay. I'm sure of it. Uh, and that's a problem, but I don't see a way around it. And other states are even more delayed than we are. Um, a lot of states are what they call a postmark state, which means you can, if you get your ballot postmarked by election day and received up to a week later, they're still counted. California is one of those states. They actually increased the seven days to 10 days. So you can see if this presidential race is a close race, this will be a problem. And I'm not looking forward to it, frankly. So I'm hoping, I know everyone will be working really, really hard to get the results in uh, as quickly as possible, but that's where we are. So I think I'll stop there. That's really more about process than anything else. Uh, we have some other really interesting programs going on. Uh, just today, the governor came to me and said, all the colleges in the state want to give the college students the day off on election day so that they can participate as volunteers at the uh, polling places or with the absentee ballots, anything that would be helpful. Uh, so I think the registrars and clerks are very excited about it. So we're going to try to work to match them all up. Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, and, uh, you know, because we do know a lot of the poll workers are over the age of 65, they may decide they don't want to work this year. So we're, we're trying to manage all that. And I think I can't say enough about the local officials. Um, you know, this is a lot of them do it for the love of, of civic engagement and democracy, and uh, they don't get paid a lot of money to do it. I know the town of Union, I remember, uh, pays their registrars $5,000 a year to do this job. So I think we owe them a big debt of thanks. They're working very hard. And so um, I hope we have a smooth election day. That's, that's certainly uh, my hope. And I know you all can help us with that because really public education is key. Oh yes, and we, we are launching a major uh, public relations uh, campaign where we'll, we'll do more of this. We'll, we'll have lots of uh, PSAs and that sort of thing going out to explain all this to the public. So thank you. I, I guess I'll stop there. Um, making Denise, we have some questions that we can start on Great. right away. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, first question is a voter saying she downloaded absentee ballots for applications for her three daughters and wants to know if this is the same application as the one that you are mailing. Uh, it is if she got it from our website. Uh, there is, we have a different uh, application on than usual. So if she got it from our website and I'm sure probably from the town websites, uh, it will be the right one. But you can tell, it says on the top something about how it's, well, if you go back to that slide that we showed you the picture of it, it has to look like the one in the slide. And it will clearly state, you know, the COVID reason. And at the top, I think it says something like about the, the November 2020 election. And this, okay. uh, to, to the person who asked this question, I know that our town clerk told me that the applications that are being mailed are actually barcoded to specifically yeah. to you, to the recipient. And she said to, for us to message to folks that if they can, if there's any way they can use that application, yeah. um, that the town clerk would really appreciate it because it, it saves them a little time. Absolutely. I don't know if you want to on. Yes, yeah. no, they're correct. It's a really a workflow thing. They are going to be inundated with absentee ballots and we, we really don't have the workforce that was ready for this. So we're gearing up and ramping up very quickly, but that's exactly right. The barcode is only on the applications that are mailed because we mailed to a certain group. We cut the list uh, on August 27th. So naturally there will be people after August 27th who will register and vote or change the registration. They will not be mailed an application. Uh, so, but this takes a tremendous burden off of them. And yes, it's true. If you can wait, you should wait because you're probably going to get it this week or maybe early next week at the latest. Okay, right. I can I can do a couple. Uh, here's a question from someone. Will the My Vote Lookup website be activated when absentee ballots start being returned after October 2nd? 
Yes, it's in fact, it's abs, it's uh, actually activated now. You can also see uh, as soon as the clerk logs in your application coming in, that's also logged in on the voter registry. So you should be able to see when the application has been logged in as well. Um, and then we will be set, the, the clerks will be sending out the ballots after October 2nd. It's not in real time, but it is within a day of when they actually input the AB. There's a special field for AB and all they do is they go down and they check AB, AB, AB. And that okay. is not in real time. It is, then they have to make a new list every day. So uh, it, it takes about a day lag, but it's up there. Okay, I'll, I'll do another one. Um, I voted absentee in the primary, dropping off my ballot in a drop box, but I think I wanna vote in person on November 3rd to make sure I'm counted immediately. I fear early returns might show a candidate in the lead, but the absentee ballots might have been counted in time. Am I right to do that? Might not have been counted in time. I'll do that again. I fear yeah. early returns show a candidate in the lead, but absentee ballots might not have been counted in time. Am I right to do that? Well, I, I would say if you want to go to the polls, it's, your, it's perfectly fine. Um, and yes, you are sure that right there it'll be counted. But we have changed the law this year in another way, and absentee ballots can be counted starting at six in the morning, uh, because a lot of them will come in and as I said, we allow the clerks to open the outer envelope so they'll be ready to go and tabulated by 6 a.m. Uh, so it won't be quite the problem it usually is. On the other hand, we're gonna get thousands of them. So I don't know. And it's true that many towns don't count them till the end of the day for the reasons I described before. So, I mean, I think it's up to you, but certainly um, there has been concern about that. That's right. And uh, I, you know, I don't know how that'll factor in in the presidential race, but of course, we being on the East Coast, uh, we will be a harbinger to some extent of uh, what's going on in the presidential race. So, but we, we're, we're pretty, um, like the two days that we need for the extra time to get all the results, all the absentees counted, that's relatively modest, I'm sorry to say. Uh, places like Pennsylvania will be a big problem. Uh, I think they'll have quite a delay in the bigger cities. Will the op official ballot drop box be emptied every day? Oh, absolutely. Sometimes more than once a day. Uh, if it gets full there, the clerks really like that. It's a good, it's a good, it's good for them. It makes things easier because all they do is they go out and they get the ballots and bring them back in as opposed to waiting for the mail every day and, you know, having to process them differently. So yes, they are processed every day. Okay. Another about the boxes. Will Stanford have more than two boxes? And how, this is another, and how often will the ballots be retrieved? You just answered that. But do you know whether Stanford will have multiple boxes? Uh, that's up to them. Uh, if they requested some, we did buy another 50 ballot boxes. Um, that's all we could get, frankly, in time. Uh, and there, there, the legislation also requires that if they have bought out ballot boxes other than next to town hall, a policeman has to uh, oh. accompany the clerk. So it's really up to the town if they think they can handle that kind of process. Um, and I don't know if Stamford has asked for more boxes or not. Okay, thank you. Do poll workers, college students or otherwise, have to be registered Connecticut voters? I believe they do, yes. Um, but I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I think so. So I would ask your local uh, registrar about that. The registrars are the ones who not only recruit, but they do the training. There is a, it's very simple, really. Uh, it's a little um, online video kind of program and test that you take as a poll worker. Uh, so I, I don't really know the answer, but I think so, yes. Okay. Uh, what will be the in-person experience at the polls? Oh, um, as I sort of alluded to, uh, we have taken great efforts to make sure that every polling place is following CDC guidelines. Uh, they, they will have to uh, make sure that they're 
Booths, booths are at least six feet apart. Only a certain number of people will be allowed in the polling place at one time. Uh, people even standing in line will have to wait, you know, be six feet apart. Uh, all poll workers and uh, anyone in the polls is being supplied with PPE from our office. We ordered this nationally. And so that's all in place pretty much from the primary. Some towns do have even the, um, the screens, uh, the, uh, you know, transparent plastic screens. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, and there's sanitizer. We are paying a uh, statewide company or if the town wants to do it themselves, they're, they're scrubbing down uh, the polling places both before and after. Uh, any pen or pencil, we're recommending if you want, if you want to really be sure bring your own, any, any ballpoint pen or pencil will work. Uh, but if the poll worker, if the um, officials are supplying the pen, they have to be single use, they collect them after you voted. Uh, that was all pretty much in place in the primary too. So, and we had very few problems uh, with that part. And as far as I know, there were no problems with anybody contracting COVID. Good. Denise, I just want to say, I, I just got information on what are the requirements to be a poll worker in Connecticut. So is, mm -hmm. I'm just going to read it out, out loud right now for that uh, person who asked the question. You, you do have to be registered to vote in Connecticut. That's you do right. have to be at least 18 years of age. You do have to be entitled to compensation. A political affiliation is generally required. You must be a resident of the town in which you apply. You have to complete required training and students with residency in the town who are 16 years or older may work with written permission from a parent or guardian. And to sign up, you do have to contact your local registrar's office. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say I was questioning that 18 year old part because I know 16 year olds may work in the polls and lots of towns do encourage the high school students to come work at the polls. And they usually pair them up with one of the standard, you know, the usual poll workers and they make a nice team. So we, we have a, a few questions that are also similar. I just like to combine them. Um, it's about what happens if you get an absentee ballot and you decide that instead you want to go to the poll and vote in person. Yeah. Not a problem. As long as you have not cast a ballot, you just tear it up, discard it, and go vote as usual. It's and if you did cast your ballot and you showed up at the polls to vote in person, would they turn you away? Yes, if it had been received and logged in uh, at the polls, there would be a little field that says AB, and it would say, oh, you voted AB, not eligible. Yeah, I've, I've worked at the polls, and it, it, that is exactly the way it works. Yeah, yeah, and it works very well. Uh, you know, I know, I think during the primary, a lot of people were concerned because the storm and the postal service, there were people that didn't get mail for four days. Yeah. So they were concerned if they had already mailed their ballot, they had no way to know if it ever got there. And so we did have people showing up and saying, I want to vote because I don't know if my ballot was received. I think our ballot tracking system will take care of some of that, um, quite a lot of it, hopefully, uh, because people were flooding our office with calls about this. Mm -hmm. So, but if that happens, if you show up, if it's been logged in, if you have voted, you get turned away. And at the end of the evening, if somehow you voted and your ballot hadn't been received, but it got received on election day, uh, the, the absentee ballot would simply be discarded. Okay, here's something a little different. Can you please check the design of the web page that displays voter registration and ballot return information? The size of the fonts and physical page layout is virtually unreadable and needs redesign badly. Many thanks from a friendly web design expert. Oh, boy, you're breaking <laughs> my heart. You know, this has been just an absolute nightmare because here we go, state bureaucracy. We are not in control of the design of our page. Uh, we were, <laughs> but then they went to a statewide common platform. And so we have to work within their parameters. But thank you for the suggestion. We have been working on it. And I keep making noise about it. And now that everyone's looking at it, it's more important than ever. So 
we're trying, uh, but I don't hold out much hope that we'll be able to do much better um, before the election. We're stuck with exactly the, only the fonts that they let us use, for example. All right. Is there any circumstance where I will not be informed that my absentee ballot has been rejected? Oh, that's completely possible. I, I, most towns, uh, particularly smaller towns, as I was saying before, if there's a problem with your ballot and it will be rejected because you didn't sign it or it's not sealed properly or something like that, most towns will call you or try to contact you by email. But if they have no way to contact you, there is no way to tell you that that's going on and then you will not know. Okay, uh, two similar questions. Uh, will cities like ours, I'm thinking this might be Stanford, will city, cities like ours hire more counters to app for ab absentee ballots to expedite the final numbers? I certainly hope so. And again, that is up to the clerks and the registrars. We have sent Stanford, I think about $100,000 to take care of that extra expense. Uh, we, we just announced the other day, we sent out $2.3 million to cities and towns so they would have the resources they need to hire people or use the volunteers. I think that towns ought to look at these college students, a lot of whom are home at least part of the time, and they're volunteering. We do, we're gonna have a website at the governor's office. It's already there actually, but we're gonna uh, streamline it so that you can tell, if you're a college student, you can sign up, you know, give us what town you live in, and hopefully they will call on these young people because we need to engage them. And I think this is a perfect way to do it. So I'm hoping that the local officials will take us up on this offer. Okay, here, you might have touched on this, but I, I, it's a little different. I'm feeling more comfortable voting in person, but would prefer to vote absentee and use the drop box to avoid the post office issue. Having said that, would you, and it's in quotes, so I guess it means you personally, Secretary Merrill, prefer to have absentee ballots dropped off to have less people vote in person? Oh, no, no. I, honestly, managing this number of absentee ballots, because I'm figuring, if we figure there are 2.1 million voters registered right now, and there probably will be more by election day. So let's say there's another couple hundred thousand, and we're figuring 80% of them show up, and then of those that 50 or 60% vote absentee, well, you can do the math. We're talking about processing over a million absentee ballots. And that is daunting. So uh, I still think if you, go, if you wanna go to the polls, go to the polls. I'm gonna go to the polls. I'm, I'm in a high risk category, technically, but um, I just wanna go to the polls because I always am. <laughs> So I'm feeling confident enough about it that I think I'll be safe at the polls. And so if that's a factor for you, um, you know, go ahead and do it. But uh, I think either way, you're fine. Your vote's going to get counted. I don't know about you, Clara, but I'm voting in person and I am assuring other people that in person voting, um, we're taking great pains to be safe and that it will continue as per usual. There were many questions about whether in New Canaan, if our polling places were going to be closed or different or different hours, and the answer is no. The polling places will be open as per usual from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's right. Okay. All right, here's an international. Yeah, there was, I'm sorry. Go, ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think there was so much conversation about absentee ballots. There are still a lot of people that think that, the, they, that they can't vote in person. Uh, you know, I've had several calls just in the last few days where people said, well, are the polling places going to be open? I didn't know that. You know, so I think that's part of the fallout from all this. Okay. Uh, this person says he will be in Amsterdam. So no one has talked about voting from abroad. Would you like to talk about, you know, getting the application earlier and um, getting it back into the mail quickly if the person is abroad? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're just stuck, you know, downloading the application and sending it in. Or um, sometimes, you know, in some towns, the clerks will mail you an application if you call in and ask for it. But uh, there's a special website 
uh, for people who are abroad where you can get your ballot more easily. And honestly, I don't know that much about it, um, but I know we are not mailing applications abroad. So if you are abroad, you have to go the regular way, which is get an application, either download it from our website, print it out, mail it back, and hope for the best. <laughs> I would also recommend, Denise, that that person um, who is abroad right now, wherever they are registered to vote, whatever address they're registered to vote at, I would also recommend possibly calling that town clerk yeah. because I do recall once being abroad many, many years ago and voting at the American Embassy. Um, and so I don't know, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure what the options are, but if this person is at all worried that they're not going to get their application in and the ballot back in time, I would get on the phone right away. Yes, exactly. That's kind of what I was alluding to. I think most town clerks will do that if you call them or contact them by email, they will send you an application. Okay, thank you. Um, is there, I guess, is there any campaign planned to tell voters how safe the polls will be? I think we, we just talked about some of the uh, PPE and maybe you could just elaborate on that a little more. Yes, there, uh, that it will be part of our PR campaign, the safe polls plans. And you know, every town has been required to have a safe polls plan. So they, they have to think ahead about exactly how they're gonna accomplish all those guidelines. Uh, and I think people are taking it very, very seriously. I, I really uh, don't think it's going to be a problem. I think all of them will have masks. The only question I've had, which um, I'm not even sure I should bring it up, but I mean, it is a question as to voters coming and not wearing a mask. We cannot positively require people to have a mask on because you cannot uh, disenfranchise any voter for any reason. And so it's kind of a thorny issue. Uh, and what we're recommending is that uh, moderators and poll workers gently require it, uh, have some extra masks in on hand in case someone forgets one or even someone who doesn't want to wear it. I'm hoping that we don't have that in Connecticut. I think there are fewer people here that are so dead set against masks that they won't wear one. And I'm hoping if those people who maybe can't breathe well with a mask on or something like that, just choose to do absentee balloting. I mean, that would be the best answer. Okay. Uh, there are a couple questions here relating to how the absentee ballots will be counted. Is the actual counting of the votes done the same way if the vote was in person versus absentee? That is, do they go in the same machine Another question is asking whether um, they get, whether they count the votes right after the polls close, whether they count the uh, absentee votes right after the polls close. Uh, both, yes to both questions. The tabulators that are used um, are used to count absentee ballots as well, but that's part of the kind of um, process problem we have because every polling place is required to have one tabulator and one backup tabulator in case the first one breaks down for some reason. And so what a lot of towns do is during the day, they can be counting absentee ballots during the day, but they use that backup machine usually. But yes, they have to be put through the same tabulators, the same process is used, we vote on paper, we keep the ballots, we uh, count them you know, as part of the machine count at the end of the night. But the, most of the absentee ballots end up being counted at the end of the night because there's going to be so many, they won't be able to get them all done during the day. But I think that will be helpful. Normally, you can't start counting until I think it's 10 a.m. Uh, now it'll be earlier, and I think that'll be a better process for the, the amount we're expecting. Denise okay. and Clara, we have confirmation uh, that the town clerks have special arrangements for overseas voters. The regular okay. application to apply for absentee voting. Yes doesn't work if you're abroad. So do we, we do have confirmation on that. Whoever it is from Amsterdam, or if you're listening from other parts of the world, um, or know someone who, who will be voting from abroad, please call the town clerk. Right. 
Okay, there's another question here. Um, person's daughter lives in Switzerland, wants to know if she should mail her ballot to her mother uh, to drop in the box or mail it in herself. I, I guess it might be time to mention that you can't handle somebody else's ballot. Is that correct? Well, you can if you're a family member and you have their permission. Oh, you can. Uh, yes, yes. If you're a family member or a caretaker, there's a little list of people who are able to handle your ballot for you. So yes, she can definitely give her mother permission to take her ballot to the ballot box. Okay, great. Um, I think we've done many of these. Oh, here's another one. Uh, are we worried that we will have all polling locations open, not just in New Canaan? Uh, well, we, we, they're required to report to my office exactly what polling places are open. I have taken a very dim view of eliminating polling places. We saw real problems in some parts of the country when they did that, assuming that everybody was going to vote absentee ballot. But you know, we don't know where we're gonna be in November. We don't know if people are, you know, human behavior is a factor here. So uh, we are, by and large, every polling place will be the same as it was in the primary. And many of those were the same as they always are. Uh, there are individual cases where maybe the polling place isn't big enough to accommodate social distancing, for example. Uh, and so there have been some changes. I think Westport, they went to the high school instead of the middle school or something like that. So there are occasional uh, questions like that. But uh, I really don't like that. It causes a lot of voter confusion. Even if you're just moving a polling place, just trying to let the public know about it is a challenge. So. But do you think, Denise, that, but do you, this questioner just followed up and said that the concern is because of a lack of poll workers? Oh, no, we can't, uh, we don't cancel polling places. They have to find poll workers. Um, and like I say, we're going to have a, a, a complete bank of people who want to volunteer at the polls. So uh, I have not heard from many places that people are short of poll workers. That's been sort of surprising, to be honest. Uh, but we have been working with the registrars for months now, trying to say you have to have a safe polls plan. And part of that plan was let us know if you think you're short of poll workers. And, you know, it's certainly possible that at the last minute, uh, their regular stable of poll workers will decide they don't want to work. But uh, we have told them over and over again, if you need help, we will try to help. And we do have this volunteer site where I think we already have 250 people signed up right there. So we, we would be able to help with that. Okay. Uh, someone, I think, is actually answering, confirming what you said. New Canaan had a 39% turnout for the primary with 67% voting absentee. Yeah. All irregular polling places will be open and hoping for a great turnout. So he's confirming yeah. that in Canaan, uh, everyone, all the polling places will be open. Someone else wants to know in Stanford, do they count the absentee ballots at the polling place or centrally? I honestly don't know, town by town, who does what. Most of the cities do central counting, I believe, but I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, maybe somebody who's listening in from Stanford knows the answer, I don't know. Okay, will the AP get machine votes right after the polls close? I think you answered this. Yeah, I mean, usually they do, um, and probably they will again, but I think everyone is keenly aware that the absentee ballot voting is going to be uh, more substantial this year. And so I don't know how that'll play out, but I will tell you that the National Association of Secretaries of State have been working with the media to try to get them not to call the election as soon as they usually do. A lot, you know that a lot of the networks will call the election when there's 1% of the vote in. So we're hoping that we will all kind of abide by that this year. You know, there's no telling for sure, but we're trying. Okay. Many registrars are getting pushback from towns and school officials. Any help you can give would be appreciated, like a strong arm. <laughs> I guess they're referring to the fact that schools need to be closed on election day. Um, and I don't, it, it's a town by town thing. I did have a conversation with the commissioner of education just today about, um, the need to hopefully have most schools that are used as polling places either be closed for the day or use that as a day to do online learning. Um, 
I don't think there's any way uh, at this point we would compel that, but certainly it is going to be a recommendation from the state level. I think, I think for security reasons too, it's good for yes, the kids. Yeah, all kinds of reasons. Uh, I, for years, I, I, we introduced legislation a couple of years ago, uh, but that idea of, um, of individual um, authority goes far in Connecticut. So uh, he is going to the superintendent's association to talk to them about it and to uh, make a plea for, uh, I would love to see all of Connecticut schools closed on election day. Use it as a day for civic learning. Uh, you know, we have a red, white, and blue schools program that I've been working with with the Department of Education for a number of years now. It's a great opportunity. The kids could all study something for the day, whether it's a, a president from the past or, you know, there's so many lessons you could do. And uh, it's just a perfect opportunity for that. So I'm hoping that the state board and the superintendents will see it as that. And I think that would be ideal. I'm an old social studies teacher myself. So I, I just think it's a, it's a great opportunity, especially since we're all struggling with, should schools be open? How many days of online learning? It's kind of all over the place. So um, we're gonna try, uh, but it will still be a town by town decision one way or the other. Okay, um, I, there's one more question, which it says Michaela would like to answer. So uh, I think that um, this has been a good experience for everybody who is uh, listening and uh, we will find out about getting it recorded and having it available to people at a later date. Myvote.ct.gov. Right, okay. so if you go in the chat box, people, there's myvote.ct.gov. This is the Secretary of State's website where you can register to vote, download an application for an absentee ballot, check your voter status, and you can find answers to all your election-related questions there. Another great resource is vote411.org. This is the League of Women Voters' one-stop shop for elections information. And I've listed in the chat here the Darien Town Clerk, Karen Diller, her phone number and email, and also the New Canaan Town Clerk, Claudia Weber, her phone number and her email. And um, so Clara, if you wanna say a few words um, or Darien Library as well about the recording and where people can find this um, program, if they, okay. if they missed it. Yeah, I, th I think that a lot of people are interested in finding the program later. Um, and I want to thank the Darien Library, thank Michaela. This was a great idea. I think it was well attended. And the information is certainly very, very pertinent uh, this year. So thank you also to Secretary of State Denise Merrill. We couldn't have done it without you. And thanks for all the work you're doing to help people vote safely and, and in a healthy way. Oh, thank you. And so, thank you so much for having me. This is such important information. So everything you're doing is helpful uh, to informing the public about what their rights are to vote and that they can be sure that their vote will count in Connecticut.